Welcome everyone and welcome back to the next session of our March Digital Virtual Health Series. I'm Stephen McCollum, our program host and MC. Thank you all for joining us. And of course, thank you to our sponsors of this session, uh, Bright MD and MealSoft, which is a Salesforce company. Without your support, this program wouldn't have been possible. You can check out information about MuleSoft and Bright MD on the website, along with all of our other sponsor and partner information. So thank you all. I uh, also wanted to make a little teaser announcement. Uh, during our last session of the day at three o'clock Eastern, we're gonna be making a pretty big announcement about the Digital Virtual Health Series. So make sure you tune in for that uh, during that session. And um, a couple of housekeeping things real quick. If you have questions for our panelists during this session, you can drop them into the chat box or you can uh, use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you use the raise hand button, we'll actually be able to call on you live and you can ask your question live. So I encourage all of you to do that. It's a great way to interact. And of course, if you don't wanna do that, you can just drop them into the chat box. If you guys could go ahead and click on the chat box for me, make sure that's open. If you look at the bottom, it says two, and it should say all panelists. You need to change that to say two, all panelists and attendees so that you, uh, your answers can be seen by all of the attendees uh, when I put in a few prompt questions here in a few minutes. Um, of course, I will be dropping a link to the speaker bios in the chat box so you can read the full bios of all of our speakers. Um, and I believe that covers all of my housekeeping announcements. Uh, we're super excited to have all of these panelists with us today. Unfortunately, uh, Pam Landis had a family emergency and is not able to join us. So our, our best goes out to Pam, but I know uh, Mike and Ray and Kevin and Jason will be able to have just as good of a conversation, even though we wish Pam was here. Uh, but let's go ahead and get everyone introduced. I'm gonna do our quick introductions by name, title, and org, and then I'll turn it over to Rajiv uh, and we'll have uh, each of the panelists tell you a little bit more about themselves. So I'm just gonna go left to right as I see people on my screen. Of course, we have our moderator, Rajiv Leventhal, uh, who's managing editor here at Healthcare Innovation and moderator extraordinaire. Uh, we have Jason Rothbart with MuleSoft, which is a sales comp Salesforce company. Uh, Jason is the Area Vice President of MuleSoft National Payer and Provider. Welcome, Jason. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Michael Woodruff, who is the Chief Patient Experience Officer at Mentor Mountain Healthcare. Welcome, Dr. Woodruff. Uh, we have Dr. Ray Costantini, who is the co-founder of BrightMD. Welcome, Ray. And he's also a board member of BrightMD. And then last but not least, we have Kevin Mabit. Uh, Kevin is with Intermountain as well, and Kevin is the Senior Vice President and Chief Consumer Officer at Intermountain Healthcare. And Kevin, I just learned something about you uh, from your coworker during the pre-call, is that you used to work for Disney. So I think that's pretty cool. I didn't catch that in your bio. So uh, that's pretty awesome and quite the shift uh, to healthcare, but glad to have you here. And thank you all to all the panelists for joining us. And with that, I'm going to turn my camera off. I'm going to turn the session over to Rajiv, and he'll take it away. Welcome again. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It'll be great to, to hear from everybody throughout this next hour. Um, it's a really hot button and emerging topic that we're talking about here, uh, patient engagement and kind of navigating the new experience, building the perfect, perfect digital front door. Um, of course, a lot of what that meant uh, has changed over the last year in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we'll get into to all of those new efforts and initiatives as well. Um, I know Stephen gave a quick introduction, but uh, I would like each to just go around and spend 30 to 60 seconds uh, to have each of you just describe quickly your role in your organization, and then we'll get into um, all of the questions and the great topics that we have outlined. Uh, Dr. Woodruff, uh, why don't we start with you and, and Intermountain? Sure, hi Rajiv. It's great to be here. Um, Mike Woodruff, I'm an emergency physician by training, been in practice about two decades, and um, I am the Chief Patient Experience Officer for Intermountain, and that role oversees um, a number of functions for the healthcare system, and that includes patient safety, uh, quality measurement, and patient experience, and we work very closely with Kevin, uh, who's our uh, Chief Consumer Officer, and he um, we're really trying to look at the, the whole continuum of um, consumer to patient as being a person's journey. So taking care of whole people, uh, not necessarily taking care of just patients or just consumers and really great partnership there. So great. Uh, yeah. Great. Thanks, Dr. Ruff. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear from, from Kevin on that because he came from outside the healthcare sector, as, as Stephen mentioned. Uh, Kevin, why don't we just go right to you, uh, also at Intermountain, just briefly describe your role for us. Thank you, Rajiv. And um, yeah, 
I've been in this role for just over three years. It is a new role. Chief Consumer Officer is not a title or a, a role we've had at Intermountain previously. Uh, I'm also the Chief Marketing Officer, but if we focus on the consumer piece today, um, really that just entails understanding uh, the needs and expectations of everybody we serve. And in fact, it includes our employees too. And then developing um, solutions to address the many pain points, as well as opportunities in the experience end to end. And, you know, we will probably talk about the digital front door. We just launched ours and happy to talk about that. Um, three years here, I came from Disney, as you mentioned, and, um, you know, same consumers, in fact, but a very different experience, different expectations. And we're, we're really shooting to create an experience that is um, as good as Disney, Amazon, Delta, you name it, outside of healthcare. So back to you, Rajiv. Thank you. Great, thanks. Let's uh, go to Jason uh, next. Jason, um, kind of briefly describe your organization and your role there. Sure, thanks Rajiv. Uh, Jason Rothbart, I've been with Salesforce and now MuleSoft for about 12 years. Uh, I've been working in healthcare most of the time. I think it's a, a great time to be in healthcare as, and as I mentioned earlier about Disney, trying to bring, bring engagement and the technologies and the experiences that we've seen in other industries to healthcare. So I work at MuleSoft, which is an API platform. Uh, the company was acquired by Salesforce about four years ago. We're doing lots of work in healthcare right now uh, with innovative uh, customers like Intermountain, for example. And uh, a lot of the use cases we're seeing are around like patient engagement, interoperability, vaccine management, and the like. Um, it's a pretty unique platform and it's uh, been a lot of fun to kind of bring it to this industry. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little more later. So thank you, I'm uh, honored to be here. Absolutely, thanks Jason. And uh, Dr. Cosentini, let's, uh, let's uh, close with you before we get into some of our, our themes for today's session. Thanks Rajiv. Uh, quick background on me, internal medicine trained provider, uh, serial entrepreneur, founder at BrightMD, um, uh, um, a care automation company. Our focus is on building software that helps streamline the clunky and difficult process that patients and clinicians have in interacting with each other. Clinicians spend 70 plus percent of their time really on pretty uh, administ on administrative burden on things that really don't add value to the patient or provider experience. And our goal is to build software that has made that so much better. And instead of providers having to spend uh, 15 minutes of a 20 minute visit in a computer, they're now able to deliver care in about two minutes of total time and get that care to patients in just minutes, uh, reducing the cost and making that a whole lot more accessible and delightful for both the patient and the provider in the process. So I'm, ex I'm excited to have this group together because it brings together technology solution company executives and uh, provider organization executives who have really had to work together, of course, throughout this last year, throughout the pandemic, to, um, to continue to innovate, to continue to market and outreach to their patients in so many different uh, ways from, you know, uh, making sure that it's okay and it's safe to come back in to, uh, you know, simple outreach, just giving information about the, the crisis and how it's evolving, um, making sure that they're getting the right truthful and accurate information. Uh, to things like building the digital front door and going virtual for care delivery. And all that put together has created a really different and, and new patient uh, engagement and experience environment. And to start, you know, when we think about uh, where things really uh, started to change a year ago uh, in the era of social distancing, um, provider organizations, as I said, have had to really find new ways to engage their patients without uh, those in-person uh, interactions that we're also used to. Technology, of course, was at the, the forefront of most of these efforts. Um, let's start on the, on the health system side. Uh, Dr. Woodruff, what, uh, from the uh, Intermountain perspective, what were the most notable undertakings and actions that your health system took in this area to evolve their patient engagement strategies uh, to respond to the to the crisis uh, last spring. Thanks, Rajiv. Well, I'll start, and then I'm sure Kevin can fill in some detail as well here. Um, I think a number of things come to mind. First is that we were well situated um, because of our investment in telehealth and teleservices um, before the pandemic. Um, and that allowed us to really um, not necessarily bring every single COVID patient to our, our big 
COVID hub hospitals, but rather to be able to reach out with expert consultation into our communities. It really supports our mission of keeping uh, people closer to their homes for their care and supporting local teams. We've got a very um, large geographic spread in our system and we have a number of small rural hospitals, but we're able to provide that level of expert consultation that you'd find in a tertiary or quaternary hospital out in the community, <clears throat> which is really phenomenal and, and helped us um, provide a really high level of service to our communities throughout the pandemic. I think the, the second thing I'd say um, that we did is we, we really, um, leaned in on the basic technology. So this doesn't have to be super fancy. We, I was on shift the first time we did a drive-by evaluation of a patient. We got a phone call um, that someone needed a, a COVID test who had just traveled out of the country. And this was early when we didn't know much about COVID. And we didn't know how infectious it was really. And we didn't know um, all the signs and symptoms. And so we called her on the cell, on the cell phone and said, hey, how would you like to be seen? And uh, she actually would prefer not to come into the, the, the clinic. And so we met her in the parking lot and were able to do an evaluation. And um, that was with pre-registration and really meet her where she was in order to provide that service. Um, so I'd say that it doesn't have to be super complex. Um, it's about meeting people where they are. And the last point there is that we really leaned in hard on understanding what families and patients needed in terms of visitation policy in our facilities. And um, that, that's ambulatory and inpatient. Being disconnected from families because of the social distancing um, requirements for COVID was one of the biggest emotional impacts on our patients and on our care teams. And so we leveraged um, everything we knew about science and everything we knew about humanity to ensure that we could have the, the most um, sensible visitation policies. And we we're actually able to allow visitors throughout the whole of the whole pandemic for most patients. And um, that took a lot of management of messaging in the community, but also took some basic technology with iPads and cell phones as well. Kevin, what did I miss there? That's great, Mike. Um, you know, as well as having embarked on the telehealth journey some years before, we had also uh, a year or so before the pandemic broke, begun our work on development of the DFD. And uh, so one of the things we did right at the beginning of the pandemic was to sort of spin out of that work um, an online symptom checker specifically for COVID because this is a time back in sort of, sort of April 2020 where there was a lot of uncertainty, misinformation, concern about PPE, concern about obviously infection. And so this was a, a way in which people could go safely online, get a good sense of whether they should go further in getting it checked out and keeping PPE even resources um, not being overutilized, but also keeping people safe. And that just got incredible traction uh, very quickly. And, you know, as we've gone on, that then kind of extending that into um, just online scheduling for um, testing, for vaccinations. I mean, we've just rapidly transformed to digital. Things that were probably causing us pause and can we operationalize? How does that work culturally? We just jumped in and did it. And um, you know, uh, all, all of the barriers came down. And, um, you know, so, so I'll, I'll probably end there and I know we'll talk maybe a bit more about the DFD later on. Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna get into the, the digital front door initiatives. And, uh, you know, Mike, Michael, what I, well, a couple of things I thought you were, um, said were really interesting around kind of making sure that uh, you were coming up with a thoughtful, you know, humanized approach to, um, safely allowing visitors, but not just completely restricting. And I think that's really important when you think of um, all of the disconnections and the isolation that happened over the last year. That's, that's really fascinating. Um, you know, on the solution side, Ray, what, what can you um, give us about the learnings around, um, you know, how, uh, how Bright MD has been able to sort of help uh, their clients and what you've seen and heard about uh, the technology that they're using to, um, you know, kind of shift their patient engagement strategies over the last year or so. One of the things that we've found for a, a long time, and in fact, one of the things that we were really founded on as a company was the idea that part of what has um, dehumanized the experience of care, both for patients and for providers, is technology. Uh, because we, and it's not technology itself that's done that, 
it's uh, in a lot of ways it's that we've used technology that wasn't built to enhance those experiences. Uh, and I think that this is a really interesting thing. We often continue to hear in healthcare that healthcare is um, tech averse or is resistant to tech innovation. Uh, and I think that's, honestly, I think it's patently false. It's misinterpreted. Uh, in fact, one of the stats that I point to frequently around that is the, uh, the fact that the very first professional group to, um, to exceed 90% penetrance on smartphone utilization uh, was physicians. Uh, it's not that clinicians or physicians or healthcare is resistant to tech. It's that we've been exposed to an awful lot of tech that actually makes the care delivery process worse rather than making it better. And so we've become resistant uh, because of that. Uh, we're resistant to bad tech uh, and we carry a lot of scars. Um, what we found is, you know, by by building tools that can make the care delivery process more streamlined, more efficient, more valuable, uh, we can actually make that process a whole lot better for everybody who's involved in it. You think about a 20 minute visit with your provider in an in-person or even in a video based setting, most of that time is actually spent on the keyboard. It's doing data entry. It's actually, or gathering information that you know that you needed as a clinician before you even walked into the room. And that's a bad experience for everybody who's involved in it. I mean, that's, that's stuff that really, the machines can take care of that kind of work uh, and, and now do for many health systems across the country. Um, if you flip it in a slightly different direction and think about it the other way, um, as a clinician, what do I have to sell to my patients? I really have 20 minute increments of my time and if you as a patient have got a cold, I sell you 20 minutes of my time. And if you as a patient have got diabetes, congestive heart failure and COPD and a foot ulcer and a whole raft of social determinants issues, what do I have to sell you? I have about 20 minutes of my time. And that is such a broken way to deliver care and to receive care. Uh, and what our goal has been is to help free up that time for those kinds of conditions where care can be delivered in a much more efficient way. Uh, we built what we, I would think of as a, a virtual medical resident that can review the EHR system, interview the patient for the provider, write up those chart notes, do a lot of the order entry work. I had somebody tell me once that the best EHR system is the one that the physician never has to touch. Uh, and by, by doing that, we've now liberated the clinicians to spend more time and more of their valuable expertise on the things that human beings are uniquely good at. Uh, so now if for every visit that we can streamline down to just two or three minutes of total provider time per visit for those simple visits, we've now given back the gift of 17 minutes uh, that can be spent with those patients who really do need it. And the benefit there uh, from a patient engagement and patient experience standpoint is twofold. It's helpful for those, it's particularly helpful for those patients who just really want to get that care and feel better faster uh, because we're, we're helping those health systems meet those patients where they're at and get the care in a way that they find valuable and accessible and affordable and convenient and delightful. But it also means that you've got all of that time that you can give to these patients who really need it uh, and who were being, uh, who weren't afforded that important time. Michael, so, I, I, uh, I'm really interested. I, I see a raised hand there. Uh, I'm really interested in your thoughts on this. Yeah, Ray, that, that really resonated with me. And I, and I would just take it even further. And I'd say, you know, the concept is um, getting, getting people to work at the top of their license so that we're, mm -hmm. we're getting the maximum value out of the humans we have in the system. And, and that goes for the technical skills, but also the caring that humans can do yes. for each other. And um, so we, you know, I think the challenge ahead of us is how do we design systems that previously really haven't been designed with this in mind? How do we design them to, to, to maximize the potential of all our, our human participants in the healthcare process? But yeah, it's, that's great. And Ray, you touched on something that, you know, there is this um, narrative and it's not all false that, you know, healthcare is slow, so slow and lags up in the industry. And a lot of that is fair, but there are reasons for that. And you mentioned bad technology. And it's interesting because, and we've heard this over the last year and from all different types of healthcare leaders that, you know, when you have 
when you are forced to rapidly innovate, you can, even in this slow, archaic uh, healthcare sector. And I think it's interesting, Jason, when you now know that digital innovation can move faster in healthcare, things don't have to take 300 years to develop, as some like to say. Um, you know, do you believe that industry leaders have more confidence in propelling such an initiative forward? And what was, you know, you and your organization's experience in, um, you know, helping your clients rapidly innovate uh, throughout this pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think they're getting there. The, the one thing the pandemic did was accelerate a lot of trends that I think were already happening. Michael mentioned, you know, Intermountain had already started using telehealth and telemedicine. I think, um, this situation just accelerated that and that, you know, now our customers are being forced to innovate. And, you know, one thing, so if you think about the digital front door is something we've talked about a lot, how MuleSoft contributes to that is if the front door is the door to a house, we're the plumbing, right? We help connect everything so that you can do innovative things and work very quickly. I'll give you a, an example. Uh, we have a large academic medical center that's a customer. Uh, when COVID hit, um, the uh, patients needed to basically say this one person could come visit me at this particular time because everything was very, very locked down. Well, in the beginning, they had to use a spreadsheet and post-it notes to basically manage who could come into the facility and when, and they knew that that wasn't scalable. And basically, they had already had APIs attached to Epic that were being run by MuleSoft we connected the Epic instance to their scheduling and their visitation system. And therefore they had a, a very scalable, robust way to manage the inflow of their loved ones to be able to visit the patients. And that's not something that you could easily do without um, APIs and, and a platform like MuleSoft. So what we do is allow um, customers to put basically front doors on a lot of older monolithic systems and then connect them very quickly and create this kind of agile environment where people connect things together that haven't been connected in the past. And so I think people are learning very quickly. The vaccine management's another thing that's forcing a lot of uh, our customers to have to connect with regulatory and state tracking uh, systems that they haven't had to do in the past and they had to move very quickly. So. That's another thing that we're seeing quite a bit. And then finally, obviously, interoperability, uh, regulatory uh, requirements are starting to come down uh, the road that are hitting a lot of our customers that need help. So uh, the answer to your question is, I think we're getting a lot better, but we have a, lot, a long way to go. What do you all think about what's, what's really fascinating is we look towards the future, you know, now that we've kind of covered the last year. Uh, what do you all think about the the type of strategies and type of innovation that's happened around uh, patient engagement and, um, you know, enhancing the patient experience, uh, you know, what can be applied to a post-pandemic world? So obviously, you know, some of what we're talking about is very specific to this crisis. But when you think about down the road, hopefully not too long, when we are past this pandemic, um, you know, what have we learned that will stick around in, you know, health system operations perhaps forever. Uh, Ray, what do you think about that? Oh my gosh, I, um, I hope a lot of it. I mean, I think, you know, if we talk about specific solutions that are, co that are around COVID, like getting patients scheduled for their vaccines or, or uh, helping to direct those patients to different modalities of care around COVID specifically, I mean, I think that we're very much missing the, the bigger picture of what is happening here. I think we've had a fundamental shift in the industry um, I think healthcare has been forced to embrace the patient as a consumer. Uh, I can remember in my, my past interactions with the healthcare delivery systems when I was on that side of the table, um, I had, uh, we'll call them arguments, I, uh, um, heated discussions uh, about who the, the customer of a health system was. And there were actually questions about whether it was the provider or whether it was the patient. I think those days are gone. Uh, I think that this has this has really accelerated healthcare's um, requirement that we embrace that patients, up until the moment that they are actually receiving care, they are healthcare consumers and they are making consumer-like choices. Uh, they and they, in fact, the choices that they have are uh, increasingly broad uh, and and focused on meeting their uh, on meeting their needs as a consumer. Uh, and if we don't recognize that change in the environment, 
and the change in the competitive landscape, the change in consumer expectations, and we don't meet that, then uh, healthcare is healthcare will change. The question is, will it change in a direction that we are all excited about, where organizations that are truly dedicated to the well-being and outcome of patients continue uh, to um, to stay in the driver's seat, uh, or will it shift uh, into a different place? Uh, I mean, I think you know it, the idea that. I mean, Walgreens, uh, as an example, their stated goal is to be the largest primary care provider in the world. Uh, and um, I, I think we all need to ask ourselves, is that the place where healthcare should be happening? Uh, and, and what do we need to do in order to ensure that, uh, that care continues to be delivered in the way and by the people who are best positioned to be doing that? Uh, Kevin, you, you came from Disney, as mentioned. You're uh, the chief consumer uh, officer at Intermountain. So uh, few people are better uh, are better tasked to answer the question of what it means to be consumer centric in healthcare than you. Um, you know, take me back to, you know, when you joined Intermountain, uh, you know, at this role, what was it like to have those discussions with senior leaders at the health system? Uh, around really shifting um, your, you know, how you see patients, how you view patients uh, towards how you view them as cons consumers and customers. Yeah, thank you, Raj. You know, I just want to say, you know, a lot of what Ray just said, it really, really resonates with me. Um, yeah, so I think the consumer word has, has, does continue actually to attract some interesting reactions. It can feel kind of cold and corporate and a bit kind of nauseous. Um, the fact is we're all consumers. We consume all sorts of things and it's really about usage, not choice. And so I think we've, we've sort of marginalized the consumer historically and sort of said things like, well, you don't get to choose to be ill. So why does all of this apply? Well, consume just means use. It doesn't mean choose. And so we have to acknowledge that we're all users. And I think to raise point that is providers as much as patients. Um, and I don't have a job description. I think this is really sort of to figure out we're all doing it live. Um, you know, the consumer is here. And I think as, as Ray said, has grabbed the steering wheel. I think it's probably hopefully a co-drive versus the consumer takes us entirely where they wanna go. I think there's absolutely gonna be a role. And do you think about the Walgreens, the Walmarts, the CVSs, the, the Googles, Amazons, Apples, et cetera. You know, we talked about them coming into healthcare. They are in healthcare. They're part of the healthcare landscape. They're driving with, with their sort of consumer DNA, us all to be more consumer centric, but the consumer will really win out here and, and they'll decide just like any other industry. I don't think healthcare is um, materially different. I mean, it is of course different and complexity has been used as what I would regard as an excuse for not doing this competition and those other forces are forcing us to do it. But I think we can embrace it because I think as Ray said, for me, um, if, if I really think about what consumerism is and what consumer digital solutions look like, it, it's about enabling the profoundly human interaction between say a physician and, and a patient. So the tech should enable that. It shouldn't get in the way of it. It should make it easier. It should clear the way. And um, consumerism is super simple anticipate and, and meet, meet, meet people's needs. They're, they're clinical, they're financial, they're, they're, they're psychological, you know, they're rational, they're, they're, they're irrational too. And I think as health systems, we are arguably far better placed than some of those competitors coming in to meet all of those needs. And we've got to use those competitive advantages, frankly, um, with, with some wiring consumerism to really um, continue to lead out in, in this space. Um, I, I did a session at Cleveland Clinic once around humanism meeting consumerism as if that would be some titanic fight to the death, but consumerism mm -hmm. is absolutely embracing of humanism. It's just understanding those holistic needs and meeting them. And we tend to quickly sort to the digital, which is a piece of it, but I don't think we should fall into the trap of trying to compete only on digital with, with those kinds of players we've we can do that we can partner with them but we can differentiate in all sorts of ways too ray kevin i'm really interested in how you're thinking about that in particular I, the, the digital front door to me is a fascinating thing i think that there's both promise and and a trap 
potentially there. And I think about how I've seen a lot of healthcare delivery systems think about the digital front door. It often makes me think about the um, the response that uh, Blockbuster had to Netflix. Uh, Netflix went digital, purely digital, and Blockbuster's response uh, was, well, you know, what'll be even better is this blended response where you can go online and, and reserve your movie and then go drive and pick it up. It was a digital front door to a traditional bricks and mortar experience. And I think healthcare needs to have that because we can't be purely digital. There are too many things that actually involve a laying on of hands and, and some kind of a procedure. Um, but, you know, how are you thinking about that, um, that, that complexity of making sure that we're not just putting, well, to, to be a little pejorative, putting lipstick on a pig uh, in, in, the, in that digital approach uh, to, to what needs to continue to be, at least in part, a bricks and mortar experience. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a great point. And uh, I think, you know, the trick is starting with the consumer and being very single-mindedly focused on the consumer. You know, the tech, it's all possible. It, it's not what can we do, it's what should we do. And I think, as was mentioned earlier, there's a huge healthcare graveyard of shiny digital objects that just had no particular use case. <laughs> and so we are very focused as we think about our digital front door on finding, managing and paying for care, not through how we think about it or structure ourselves, but how the consumer needs to think about it. And we co-designed it with consumers. We try to make it intuitive. We try to empower them. Um, and the entire way it's architected is to be as humanistic as you can make technology by anticipating and guiding people um, th through the journey. But I think one of the keys, and Disney is absolutely uh, a good example of this, is um, don't just chase the, the digital for all the reasons that Ray's just, just mentioned, but be very focused on the transition from the digital to the physical. Like, so now we can have you schedule online in the palm of your hand, but then if you show up and we're running late, we didn't think to tell you, that goodwill and experience gain has been dropped in a second. We can now enable you to text back and forth with your provider, but if the provider is not in the habit of returning text, it, it sort of, again, it's, it's another pain point you've introduced. So you've got to be very focused on the end-to-end, -end, the holistic and all of the transitions between the, the, the human and the digital. To me, I think, Ray, a lot of the digital should be about removing the over count, the overdraft in the bank account. So when you get to that physical interaction, the friction has been eliminated. Then you can have that great 20 minutes that you've been talking about, not distracted by tech, but actually in present in the moment. So I, I do think digital is, is, is oftentimes about removing a lot of these friction points and pain points to, to really enable the core of what healthcare is to shine. Yeah, and Ray, offline, you mentioned, um, you know, there were similar concerns when we switched to self-checkout, uh, you know, registers, and we, we removed that, um, you know, in, into personal interaction. Same with ATMs. We removed, uh, you know, going to the teller to take out money. Um, it is really a fascinating discussion thinking about maintaining human authenticity through digital platforms, right? Yeah. I, I truly believe that the best way for us to be doing that is to be making sure that we're recognizing when it's valued by the patient and valuable to the care delivery process, uh, and then removing all the stuff that's not. And I think Kevin, Michael, uh, Jason, I think all of you guys are talking about those things, whether it's the infrastructure that allows that data to flow to the right places, or whether it's the thought process about what truly needs to be happening to empower the care delivery process and which of those things are artifacts of 500 years of care delivery um, uh, muscle memory. Uh, I think it's it's a it's a really fascinating process for us to be at this crucible moment in healthcare and and to be rethinking how these kinds of things can and and candidly should be happening. Yeah, I think it's it's really it's important also as we design these experiences and processes. They're also agile and flexible because we all have different expectations and want to be communicated to or get signals on different channels and so you can't build like one experience. It's gotta be an experience with lots of different offshoots to address the fact that senior citizens might be one communicated one way, a young parent might be communicated with or have a different experience. We have to build agility and, and, and different kind of channels into what we do. You know, Jason, that's an interesting one. I, I, I'll, I'll give you an example of a, a slightly different approach that I've personally found to work. Um, you know, if, if we start, 
segmenting that way. I, I do think that there is, it's important for us to be understanding the needs of, of our different patient and healthcare consumer segments and meeting those needs. But I'll, I'll give you, I, uh, Kevin, by the way, I, I love the fact that we're hiring out of industry folks into healthcare. I think we're in dire need of that. I've been encouraging that and, and hiring folks from out of healthcare to help us rethink healthcare from back when I was at a healthcare delivery system myself as well. Um, and, and I'm always looking for out of industry examples. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar, I don't know if any of you guys cook, uh, but there's a kitchen equipment company called OXO, uh, O-X-O, uh, and they were actually originally built uh, for specifically for patients who struggled with rheumatoid arthritis. And the idea was if you can build a, a, a vegetable peeler that works for your hardest consumer segment, one that works for the patient, for the for the the kitchen equipment user who's got crippling rheumatoid arthritis, then it will be absolutely delightful for everybody else. Uh, and I think that taking that approach really works well in the digital space as well. If we can build the tools that work for our non-tech savvy, uh, low literacy, uh, struggling uh, patients. Uh, that, that don't have uh, Wi-Fi in their homes. I mean, that's what our goal has always been at BrightMD is to be able to build a tool that works for the most complex, difficult population. And what we found is that by doing that, we've built something that absolutely delights what ends up being our core audience, which is the working age adult with, uh, with kids. Uh, and I, so I think sometimes it is necessary to, uh, to, to specifically build tools for those segments. What I personally found to be better is to build tools that work for the hardest segment and delight everyone else. And I'm really interested in what other people have found around that as well. Yeah, well, it's a good point too, thinking about, uh, of course, you know, the inequities that have been highlighted at the, the front and center, of course, throughout the, the crisis. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, Ray, I just wanted to <clears throat> just highlight um, the, the patient co-design or the consumer co-design that you're, you're talking about. Well, one thing we've done really well in healthcare is assume that we know what's best for people. <laughs> oh, we yes, we're very paternalistic. <laughs> we haven't done well is really learn um, that muscle memory of how do we bring uh, people onto our teams, community members, co potential consumers and patients who have interacted with us onto our teams to, to design from the idea phase. And that's mm -hmm. that's fundamentally different than taking a finished product or a, you know, a, a proposal to a group of, of people that didn't say, here you go, what do you think? And, and um, that's, that, last, that latter approach is a checking the box approach that is nowhere near as rich or is gonna inform the design as much as bringing, bringing our constituents onto the team. Very much agreed, Michael. It's good product work is, is new to healthcare. <laughs> we have we have a good question from the from the audience that I think uh, you know plays into a lot of what we were talking about just a few minutes ago about consumer uh, you know patients becoming consumer consumers and really thinking about that holistically at a, at a way at a much different level than we historically have um, you know from the health system side we've kind of covered that how about how do we empower the patient to prepare for that type of a partnership um, which I think is a really um, it's a really fascinating point because we're, we're thinking about how Intermountain, for example, is thinking about patients as consumers. How about from the patient side, they might not be uh, you know, as privy to a lot of these things. How do we empower them to think about themselves as consumers as well? I want to take a stab at that's, that. Rajiv, that's, I, I found that to, for what we do specifically, I found that to be core. Uh, the idea of in order to empower clinicians to practice at top of license, we have to build tools that actually guide patients through the process and get further along before engaging the clinician in the care delivery process. Uh, I think understanding their needs, uh, an example of this actually is a really interesting one. Um, we, of course, it's really important to, uh, as you're, you know, if you're, if you're going to build a virtual medical resident, if you're going to build a, a platform that's going to interview the patient and gather all that information and write the chart note for the clinician, you really have to be guiding the patient through a comprehensive clinical interview uh, and, and making sure that you're gathering that information. You also need to make sure that you're not asking dumb questions. Uh, and anybody who says there's no such thing as a dumb question hasn't sat in the waiting room and filled out seven pages of forms 
and been asked what their name and date of birth is six times. Uh, those are you, you've asked five dumb questions if you've asked me that question six times. Uh, <laughs> and it's it's also really important to be asking things that are part of the the art of medicine, uh, the things that make sure that the patient feels heard. That is often the difference between getting the right diagnosis and treatment versus getting care uh, is is really engaging that patient in a way that makes sure that they feel heard and valued uh, and that they've had the opportunity to be able to uh, to express what's going on from their perspective in the care delivery process. Those are just a couple of examples that we found to be really critical to that. Well, I so, think yeah, it's going to be important for all of us to bring a beginner's mind to this process, right? And historically, healthcare has sort of hung on to information. Say, so I own the patient record, or all this data is locked up, and the patient only gets to see it when they come visit us. And we have to kind of blow all that up and, and think about how can that be different and how can the patient own that process more? They need to take responsibility as well to take care of themselves and follow through on meds or exercise or whatever, but we don't really have a good way of communicating that with patients or holding them accountable. And so I think we have to like really rethink how does that relationship work and how does the patient interact with us and partner with us? It, it, it can't be a, I do this, you do that, right? Yeah, I think we have a, a, a live question. Um, Yes, we do. We do have a live question. All right, uh, Travis, I know I told you in our chat that we would get to it towards the end, but we're going to go ahead and take the question now. So, Travis, I am unmuting you. Uh, Travis, if you can hear us, go ahead and ask your question. All right, looks like Travis's question may have been answered, but Travis, thank you for using the hand raise function. If we didn't get your question answered, click the hand raise function again, um, and we will uh, get you going. All right, let's go back to it. Rajiv, so, so thinking about you know what the, the, the patient and the health system partnering in more of a consumer-centric way it segues into our next uh, question, which is, uh, you know, we've all paid attention to recent, uh, you know, mergers and, and acquisitions in the market, Teladoc and Livongo. Uh, of course, there's so many disruptors now. There's too many to name. Amazon comes to mind, or, but again, so many others. Uh, when you think about what that means for traditional provider organizations and their patient engagement efforts in their local markets, um, so you have the disruptors and then you have these, um, you know, new and emerging you know, deals that are, uh, you know, seeing, you know, two, two market forces kind of coming together, um, you know, for patients, that means more choices, more options, more flexibility, perhaps more leverage from the health system and the provider standpoint. What does that mean? Kevin and Mike, I'd love to hear from you on this. Yeah, well, I'm happy to start. And, um, just a final point, which I think bridges to this from the last discussion, just to pick up on what Ray and Jason were saying, you know, this notion of the, cons the, the healthcare consumer being new. I mean, I think they've always been consumers just with very low expectations and a very poor experience. They just haven't had that empowerment or expectation. And so I think one of the changes needs to be cultural. Quite often I'll hear people say, well, and they typically are on the provider side. Well, if, if that's true, then I'm giving up something as if this is a zero sum game. And I think consumerism isn't so far from the purpose of healthcare as we talked about earlier and partnership is the key. I think it's also the key as to what you just mentioned, Rajiv, as disruptors come in. I can only speak for Intermountain and how we're approaching that. We're not gonna lie down and accept defeat. We're, we're partnering with some of those because we just recognize that through scale and expertise, um, they have the ability to win in some areas, but not all areas. So where they can disrupt us and we're an integrated system, we're trying to partner um, to, to scale and accelerate our um, growth in some of those areas. But we're also, you know, and again, it's becoming a bit of a cliche, but disrupting ourselves. So, so changing uh, sort of in a root and branch way, all of what we're doing, just challenging how we've done things before, um, how we deliver care, how we compensate for care, um, how we, um, you know, all of our workflows. So that's what we're doing. Um, 
in a, in a nutshell, it's partnership and self-disruption. And when you think about who is going to stand, how, how the, the winners are going to differentiate themselves and, and kind of stand atop those others in this new world of um, disruptors mixing with traditional uh, organizations, what will, uh, what will distinguish, what will be the distinguishing factors that determine, uh, you know, those who kind of come out on top? Uh, Jason, any thoughts? I think the organizations that, you know, are doing a lot what we're hearing about right now that bring, you know, other industry experiences to bear uh, to try to improve the experience of all of the stakeholders, patients, providers that come and give care in their hospitals, insurance companies, you name it, uh, loved ones of the patients. Um, I think it's, it's a beginner's mind uh, attitude. I think there's just a lot of um, assumptions and mythologies around how that patient experience has to work. And we have to really be steadfast in um, saying, hey, this, we could do way, way better, but we've got to rethink um, how we're going to do it. Um, and then finally, uh, a lot of agility. I mean, that's one of the areas where I think, you know, our organization helps is uh, companies are going to have ideas. They need to go bring this engagement system into their uh, portfolio of solutions for the experience or this data that's sitting over here. How can they do that quickly and at scale? And, and that's where we come in. And so I think you, we just have to start challenging a lot of how we've done business in the past, both from a, a technology perspective and as a process and people uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah, Rajiv, I, I would just add that um, for us, it's a focus on value. And that's value certainly des defined by the healthcare system in terms of outcomes and safety and quality, but also even as importantly, how do, how do our, our, the people we're treating, how do they define value and what matters to them? We've essentially seen that um, our society by and large has adopted a digital way of doing business for many of the daily functions of life, for communicating, for socializing, for banking, for all the things that we thought we would never do digitally, um, or at least some of us thought that, um, that's been largely embraced. And, and it's up to us <laughs> to meet the challenge of either be disrupted or figure out how to innovate and get on the platforms that people have told us they know how to use and they want to use. So the fact that everyone's on a phone doing all this stuff is a strong signal to healthcare that we need to be able to do as much as we can on their phones because that's where they want to operate. And and I love Jason, your um, beginner's mind. It's it's really a, a growth mindset, an outward mindset, a, a beginner's mind of we got to rethink this from the from the, there's there's no nothing is immune to this rethinking of how we need to do things differently. Yeah. Uh, another good question from the audience, you know, we, we discuss reducing these inequities and disparities. Um, how can technology be used to best um, incorporate uh, critical support around addressing the social disturbance of health? It's really a, a, a great question um, that is the, kind of the next frontier, really using or, or all identifying the social determinants of health uh, factors that are really important and then using technology to address them. Is anybody uh, doing work in that area that, um, you know, we could, we could share some of those lessons learned. Or if, I think if, at, if, at a high not, level, it, it, I, I remember, I well, remember I think talking to a customer about how they, you know, with the customer's permission, sharing like their Safeway or their shopping list with their provider and they could see whether they were buying healthy food or not. And that, you know, often someone's outcome or ability to respond to a treatment has less to do with the medicine they're taking or the doctor they see and whether they're eating well, they're getting exercise, uh, they have a place to live. And a lot of the data and uh, signals around those social determinants are not in the, the healthcare system. So you have to reach out and connect and have visibility into these other determinants to be able to then proactively help those patients. But it's, it's not certainly not an easy problem to solve. 
Yeah, I think the principles of applying it in a social determinant setting are not different than what you need to do anywhere else. You need to understand the, the pain that's being experienced there. You need to bring in the information or the, the you need to bring in the data to, to Jason's point. But then uh, one of the interesting things that I've, I've seen consistently, particularly in healthcare, is that there's often this confusion between data and information uh, and even more so the difference between data and actionable information. I mean, it, uh, bringing, bringing in, well, I'll actually, I, instead of a, a shopping list, I, I, I'll, I'll even go to a, something that's more obviously healthcare related, a, a glucometer, you know, I mean, for patients who have diabetes, you know, they're using their glucometer and they're gathering that information multiple times a day. Um, the truth is you bring that information into your clinician, unless you are a brittle diabetic uh, who is working specifically with uh, uh, an endocrinologist to, to enhance a, a very complicated and unusual situation, your clinician doesn't have the capacity to be able to go through your glucometer data and act on it uh, because it's not going to be impacting their care delivery. That's information that's supposed to be used in the moment of care, in, in your moment of care at home to figure out what food you should eat or what medication you should be taking. Uh, and so bringing in the right information or bringing in the right data uh, and figuring out what is useful and what's not useful, uh, and then transforming that data into the most actionable, usable format possible is the only way that we're going to go from right now we have clinicians that are drowning in an ocean of data and we're, you know, we're handing them glasses of water. Uh, we, we've got to take a different approach. We've got to say, okay, we know you're drowning. Here's tools that make that process easier, that make it more actionable, that make it so that you can bring more value to your patients uh, I think that that's a really key piece. And the social determinants is another example of that. You know, if we bring a ton of information about social determinants to clinicians uh, and we don't put it in the hands of the folks who are supposed to act on it and we don't put it in a format that is easily actionable, then nothing happens. Uh, and we just end up with more data uh, and, and no change in, in how things actually happen. A few more questions before I want to get to a wrap up closing thought from each of you. Uh, Stephen, I think we have one from the chat that you want to handle. Uh, we do, but I need to scroll through this very active chat and find <laughs> it. I lost it. So why don't you take one out of the Q&A box and then I'll come sure. back to you and I'll ask that question. Yeah, yeah, great, great, great. Lots of engagement um, in this session. Uh, so uh, another good question here from uh, from the audience looking at new federal rules around interoperability and patient access that will require, uh, you know, individuals to, to have access to their health records and, you know, require, uh, you know, technology companies to allow them to download and transmit them to third parties. Um, how do you think that will be a driver uh, as a way to, or do you think that will be a driver to increase patient engagement um, in the future? I, I think it's a, it's a good, uh, you know, next frontier type of a question. I, I do. I think what will happen and what we see is when you create that interoperability solution, APIs that kind of liberate this information to address regulatory challenges, then you can reuse them for other things, right? Like enhancing your Intermountain mobile phone experience or whatever. So by taking that information and making it available just to satisfy the government, the idea would be then reuse that uh, technology or that data, and then put it together in new clever ways with a new experience or new engagement, you know, re using that to be able to send a message to someone on SMS, because that's how they prefer to be communicated to whatever. So that's the key. Don't think of it as, wow, somebody's forcing me to do something. Think about it as, oh, yeah. I'm going to stick it on a really important piece of information that then I can go use elsewhere. That's what we think. Yeah. I Jason, I couldn't agree with you more about, oh, sorry, Michael, go ahead, please. No, go ahead, Ray. Go ahead and I'll come. I, was gonna say, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, um, in fact, I would say that folks who continue to use um, the regulatory pace of change uh, as the, the benchmark for what needs to be happening in healthcare um, are going to be left behind. There are, with the, especially with the change in competitive landscape, there are a whole lot of folks that are thinking really creatively about how to not be hobbled by regulatory barriers uh, and, and those who continue to use things like um, uh, payment uh, as an obvious one as a crutch. Uh, 
um, are going to limp along and there are going to be a whole lot of people that will pass them at increasingly rapid rates. Uh, we, we can't continue to let that be the, the hurdle uh, that, uh, that we've allowed it to be in the past. Yeah, Ray, I, and I think that gets back to how we keep this authentic for people. If, if we're pursuing um, these initiatives just to check the boxes or to avoid fines or to you know, increase our operating margin, guess what? People can tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if, we're, if we're building um, solutions to delight people and to meet them where they are and to improve access and to improve the value that they receive in their care, that's a whole different game. And that's where we need to be coming from. Yeah, I think we've got a regulation has to be a flaw, definitely not a ceiling and not even a catalyst, um, as, as Ray and Mike are saying. But I think the key, this is another one where because it's possible doesn't mean it's gonna gain traction with the consumer. So we've got a, the value prop and, and that behavioral change has to be inspired yeah. in our consumers. We've got to curate information. There's so much information, we've got to create it to make it useful for them and to encourage that mobility that they are enabled um, with, with this sort of interoperability. And, and, and then we've got to kind of link that to the clinical pieces. And again, I think that's where as health players, we, we, we have some competitive advantage to, um, to make that data actionable, to integrate it into the clinical and the experience as a whole. Because otherwise I feel we're just gonna have a lot of data in consumers' hands that won't be, won't be actioned, it won't be useful. So, so I think there's a lot of work for us to do, but I love that it empowers us. It's just not gonna be the end game. Right. Stephen, you have time to, to find that question from the chat. I do, I do. So two things, Jeff Bonner asked a question about social determinants of health and Ebony Williams also asked a, term about, a question about social determinants of health. What I wanted to tell both of them is to make sure you attend the four o'clock, or excuse me, the three Eastern session. That's gonna be all about SDOH and the two questions you asked will be covered extensively in that. Uh, the question that I do have from an audience member, and this comes from Jessica, is like you talk a lot, it says you sp you're speaking a lot about uh, working with doctors and having them work at the top of the license. How are you engaging nursing staff differently? And how can healthcare technology field support RNs and advanced practice RNs and meeting full scope of practice? So I don't know who wants to take that. We but. found that to be critical. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the quick version on that, I mean, it, the top, working at top of license, I, I hope, hopefully I didn't slip and say that we want physicians practicing at top of license. We do, but that would be far too constrained. We want everyone practicing at top of license. Uh, that's the point. Uh, if, if, we, if we have clinicians practicing at top of license, but we don't continue to lift uh, other folks uh, so that they're doing the same thing, then we end up with a gap in there and that defeats the purpose. Uh, so I think it's absolutely critical and a team-based model of care is, uh, I think honestly what we need to do is not only recognize that a team-based model of care is critical, we need to be thinking increasingly about really well-built technology as part of the digital care team. Uh, it is part of how we lift folks to their top of license, how we empower them, and in fact, can even be playing a role. When I think about, again, that virtual medical resident that we've endeavored to build at BrightMD, that's the point, is we want to be giving you a digital team member that can be augmenting and supporting those other folks that have to be working uh, uh, with uh, that information and with those patients. It's, it's definitely not limited to only physicians. Wonderful. Thank you. And so, Rajiv, I'll turn it over to you to wrap up. Great. Uh, yeah, I wanted to get to another uh, Actually, we only have two minutes. So uh, let's wrap up. Let's wrap up with one, uh, one closing thought um, in terms of, all right, let's, let's ask this. How, uh, what, what is one challenge uh, in this area of patient engagement and uh, patient experience that you believe is still uh, incredibly important to tackle? And then uh, maybe one way do you think that challenge could be solved? I'd like to hear from each of you on that. Yeah, I guess maybe I'd go first there, Rajiv. I'd say that um, the equity question that's come up a couple times in the chat um, and in the discussion is both um, going to be a huge challenge, and it's an imperative that we that we face it. Um, but it also could be tech could be part of the solution here. Um, we, we know there's a digital divide, but I, I've met few people that don't have a cell phone. And so the yeah. extent to which we can leverage the pet platforms that people do have, I mean, how many more people have a cell phone than an actual mailbox, right? Um, so how do, we, how do we leverage those platforms to actually decrease the digital divide 
and, and be agile around addressing inequities in our system. Yeah, just quickly, we had a, a hospital at home program last month or two months ago, and uh, somebody mentioned that everyone thinks that tech, technology, sophisticated technology is the problem, uh, when really, in, in reality, so many people don't even have your basic broadband access to, you know, be able to access some of this technology. And it's not just in rural areas, it's in San Francisco and New York City as well. Uh, so, so good point, right? Uh, I'm going to cheat and give two and I'll make it really fast. So one of them, I think, is we need to increasingly align incentives uh, around uh, what healthcare actually should be. Uh, I think the fee for service has grossly misaligned the incentives of healthcare delivery systems from the interests of patients. Patients don't want more healthcare. Uh, they want to not have to have healthcare uh, and moving to a more value based model of care is going to empower us to do more. Uh, it, it will incent us as an industry to do more to engage patients and change the way that we're interacting with them. The second one's a little bit more focused, uh, but I, I think I truly do think that the uh, the fact that we're spending 70% of provider time on administrivia, on on low level tasks that just honestly get in the way of care delivery, increase the cost of care, reduce the experience of care, and do nothing to improve the true clinical outcomes of care. Um, I mean, think that is that lies at the root of so many of the symptomatic problems that healthcare consistently points at needing to solve: patient access, provider burnout, increasing cost of care. Uh, the, uh, the honestly, the oxygen that we've given to new entrant competitors, all of that ends up coming from this supply-demand mismatch uh, of more patient demand than there is provider capacity. And that comes from the fact not that we don't have enough clinicians, but that we're squandering the most valuable resource that we have in healthcare. Uh, so being able to solve that, I think, is really critical. Yeah, great points. Uh, Kevin had a drop for a meeting, but Jason, we'll close with you. Yeah, I, I don't think our biggest challenge is technology. I just think it's more mindset and attitude. Uh, we have to start uh, not saying why not to do something, but uh, how can we, right? And and don't be held back by worrying about, I mean, you have to worry about security and privacy and all that clearly, but there are ways of doing it. The banking example where you can now deposit a check using your phone, people have figured this out. So uh, I think we have to, like we said earlier, blow up all of our assumptions and, and really try new things and experiment and uh, be open. Um, that's my, I think that's the biggest challenge of facing the industry right now. Great, great to hear from all of you. This is, we're, we're up against it. This was an amazing discussion with great uh, engagement and interaction. Uh, Stephen, let's kick it back to you. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, panelists. Y'all did a wonderful job. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, so we're going to wrap up. We'll be back here at 2 p.m. Eastern for our next discussion on patient engagement, which is going to be a very uh, slightly different approach or a very different approach, talking more about technology stacks and uh, what some hospitals had to do to actually make their uh, patient first strategies work. So we'll be talking about that at two o'clock. And then of course, we're rounding out the day with our social determinants of health panel at 3 p.m. where we're gonna be making a big announcement about the digital virtual health series. So join us then. Thank you all again so much, Mike, Jason, Ray, have a wonderful afternoon. Appreciate it. And we'll see you all soon. Pleasure. Take care. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.